Where's the, your better half, Sam Jackson? Is he gone? I'm joking. The, the, my much better half, not right. my better half. Yeah. Uh, listen, man, I got a ton of questions for you. I even wrote them down so I wouldn't uh, screw this up. Okay. Uh, I want. Be, normally, I ask about other stuff at the end, but I'm just starting with other stuff at the beginning to get that through. Uh, we've talked in the past. Uh, what is the status of Kickass? I'm, I'm, some of these things are things we've talked. Okay, about. yeah, yeah. The, st the, the status of Kickass, or should I say, the status of Kickass? Right, but you know, American. Um, I, I don't um, know what the right word is. Neither do I. Um, I we are in the middle of writing it. Um, we're doing a movie at the moment, which uh, is a clue to it. There you go. As, you know, this is going to be the new thing. So you can figure out what that is. That's all I can say. But this this bunch of people okay. are going to be making the reboot of Kick-Ass. I know. And we're, and we're halfway through shooting their first film. It's very exciting. You mentioned to me you have a script for it. Or is it? do you still have a script for Kick-Ass? Are you still writing it? No, we have it. We're halfway through it because it's a very, very, dare I say it, and it's going to be a cliche coming out of my, my this, this head of mine. It is a very, very meta universe. It's, it's you know, what, you know, Kick-Ass was reinventing and creating an R-rated superhero when no one was really doing it. This is taking that whole concept to a worthy, not even a sequel. It's a, because I think it, it, it's just a whole new way of doing Kick-Ass, which couldn't be more Kick-Ass. So, well, um, I mean, you were also, you made that well before the boys, well before other people have played in Deadpool, the R, you know, yeah, that have yeah. played in the R-rated space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you're looking at the things that have come out and said, how do we tweak this or one-up? Yeah, how do we do, an, do a commentary on pre-kick-ass, post-kick-ass? Sure. And post-kick-ass has a lot to do commentary on. What is the status of the Kingsman franchise uh, mm -hmm. in Kingsman 3 slash mm -hmm. what's going on? So Kingsman 3 we've got to get on with before... <laughs> Colin is way too old, and dare I say it, Taron's getting getting on as well. So um, Kingsman 3 is definitely the conclusion of their relationship. Um, it's the Act 1 is being written, Act 3 is being written, Act 2 needs some work, right? And um, so we know how it ends, we know how it begins. Um, and ironically, there has been this business side of, of Marv where, you know, it, it's a rare moment where we've got Kingsman back, we've got Kick-Ass back, we've now got Argyle, we have one other thing that we're working on, we're shooting at the moment, and it's, it's it, there's something that I want to try and keep them all under the same roof, so there could be a lot of, you know, nods and winks and, and create this sort of whole new new um, way of, of, we say the next, Marv point three, probably, I call it 3.0 now, and... Um, so it will happen sooner than later, but it's got to be done right. Um, and I just have to know who my long-term partner is to make it because there's a lot of things I want to do, and not me. I want, you know, and, and as I said, with the directors and the team that we put on to kick ass and I'm making this movie with at the moment, it's untitled. I would, you know, it's, might be calling it Vram. That's what that says, you know. Um, but this team are sort of, they just reminded me of me 20 years ago where they're brave, and um, and they're doing a fantastic. This film we're making at the moment is going to have the same impact Kickass did. It's something like you. I will show you some of it maybe on my phone. It's fucking I say, awesome. I say yes. So at this moment, you're saying to me that the Kingsman franchise and and Argyle, these are all owned by Marv. Meaning, yes. like, if you decide to make Kingsman three, it will go to whoever wants, like, whoever works out the deal with you. Correct. So literally, like Netflix or Apple or anyone can get it. Anyone who is interested, yes. Okay. Uh, whatever happened with um, you know, the movie musical that you told me about like two, three years ago? We're prepping. Is it shooting this year? Well, I found out that musicals are very hard to do, right? So it's a lot more prep. And this has got puppets in it as well. And it's, it's, it's very different. It's not what anyone's going to be imagining. Um, so... Um, and you've got to get the music right, the choreography right, right the design. It's, it's, it's something um, much bigger. Uh, I mean, musicals are really, really hard to do. <laughs> I'm finding it out right the way. It's, it's, so I was, I, there's a chance I get behind the camera with it this year, but only, you know, we haven't got the music right yet. And a musical is really only as good as the music. And um, we have the story, we have the characters, we have the script. 
but we've got to get the music right. So that takes time, and you know, so so once we've got the music right, we're ready to go. Yeah, the, one of the things about musicals is that there is no adjusting on set. It yeah. all of that has to be ironed out. You know, exactly. So I can't be cavalier saying, we're going, guys, we're going to figure it out. We're going to, um, this one, I have to be even more disciplined. And you haven't done a musical before. Um, Does it have a title? It, well, at the moment, well, we're calling it, well, it's really egotistical, but on the board it says, it's a musical, but M-V-I-S-C-A-L. <laughs> so that's what we're saying at the moment. Is so it, it hasn't got a title yet, no. Is it more PG-13 or more no, it's R? harder. As a musical? As a musical. Have you seen Dick's The Musical? I um, haven't had a chance yet, but I have it on my uh, platform to watch. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. just curious. Yeah. Um, what happened with School Fight? It's, it's, we've got that in the can. I, I know. And it's... though the guy, so School Fight was sort of the proof of concept of me backing my second unit team. Is and it? They're, uh, and they're, they're now working under the banner of Ram. Right. And I will show you some stuff. <laughs> Right. I think so, I've got some on my phone, and I'll just watch your jaw hit the fucking ground. So with School Fight, the movie's done. School Fight's done. And is and it possible that it's coming out anytime soon? Yeah, it will come. No, it will not soon, because it's going to be part of a trilogy. The trilogy will be School Fight, this movie, let's call it Vram for the time being, and then Kick-Ass. And they all, they're all connected. That's so interesting. And are you yeah. planning on having all three done before the first one comes out? No. So when this is finished... Um, I think we'll. I, I think this will launch. I'll be conservative on this. The um, if we're lucky, Toronto. If we're not lucky, Sundance. Okay. Is next it year. or this year, next year? If you know what I mean. And they all take place in the same universe. Yes. Got it. Okay. I'm gonna. I, I have so many other things. What happened to the R-rated quiz show pilot? We shot it. And we're still trying to find someone brave enough to do it. <laughs> oh, really? So yeah. It, it's, it's, a, it's not my wall, but I showed it to someone very powerful in the TV business who looked at me and went, why has no one made this? And I was like, because it's an R-rated game show and it's different. And I'm hoping he um, he's 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 going off to try and set it up. I'm excited about that. I didn't know you know about that. So you, yeah. you, you told me. Yeah, I told you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I did yeah. my, you know, before coming in yeah. here, I'm like, uh, yeah. you know. Um, As I said, we're looking for that partner because Marv, you know, people can't, you know, Marv really is six people, right? You know, that's it. So there's only so much we can do. And we've become, uh, uh, the success of Marv is becoming the, um, the downfall of Marv because we have too much IP and too many things to make. We haven't got enough people to do it. So... And sadly, the man. I mean, I, I mean, I've had a real, really, really sad time with, with you know, I lost Brad Allen, and then my, one of my producers, Kevin Turin, who's going to be running, you know, died as well. Only you know, forty three or forty four, and he was going to be running the Vram side. So, we're, you know, we, we, I do need a partner, and that's what we're, you know, we're talking to various criminals in, in Hollywood right now, and uh, trying to figure out because we're an unusual now. We're like, okay, we have all this stuff. It's ready to go, but I can't do it on my own anymore. I've, I've outgrown what it is and I have to learn. Somebody said to me and they're right. Delegating creativity is not easy. Um, so I got to start letting go of, of, you know, you know, hiring and teaming up with the right people. So the sequels can be made. Well, I, I like making the firsts. And that's the new business plan is I keep making the first or something and then we hand it over to the system to make the second and I oversee the second and I want to break some new young direct. That's what this is. I'm breaking new young talent and but we're doing it properly. We did a small film, then we're doing a medium film and then we're going to do a massive film with Kicker so that they have a chance. I think a lot of directors, Hollywood picks them up after they've done one really good little indie and then just, you know, throws them into this big film and then they just get it's a different muscle group that they haven't developed. And, you know, look at Spielberg, Donna. They started in TV. They really built up to being masters. And I and I just think some young kids need that. I want to be a mentor to the young directors now. I One of the things I've talked about with other people when they bring up you is that you, there's so much that you could do. And that's why I'm gonna, my next question is 2024. Yes. What are you actually thinking you're going to film this year? Um, I think I will. Do, there's a pilot for a book called Lexicon, which we've written now. Um, so I think I'll do my first TV show. Um, I'll be prepping the musical all year. And there's a few movies. Well, this was meant to be my small lockdown movie, by the way. Okay. Right. All right. So I'm trying to say to myself, let me find a proper. I'd love to shoot a movie this year while prepping the musical because I am dying to get behind the camera. These poor buggers. 
on this movie because I was behind them like frothing, going, oh, why don't you do this and let's do that? And, and I'm sure and they loved you. I was like, do you want me to direct second unit? It got to that point, go, I'll go off and direct. I'll, do you, want me, you need a close up of a tea bag going into a, into a teapot? I'm your man. I was just desperate to direct again. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I hope to shoot the, the pilot of Lexicon, prepping the musical, and a few other things I'm thinking about as the smaller movie, which I could shoot properly while prepping another film. And hopefully Kingsman somehow is being... That will be the know. next year, because Taron's bloody busy. He's doing... Um, sure doing another movie and he's got another the, the guy that did Blackbird they're doing another big TV show so yep. you know I, I have to wait for his availability as well jumping into why I get to talk to you mm -hmm. um, so who wrote the book who wrote which book uh, Argyle oh Argyle Ellie Conway really yes for sure well it, it, it didn't just appear okay you know I'll leave that there you know? how many books are planned five if you were to make a sequel to Argyle do you know what the sequel is right now yes is it, does it have a script or is it sort of like the idea is there? Scriptment. Got it. Was the ending of Argyle always the ending that you were working towards or did it sort of shift at all during the making? Always the ending. You got this, that, this, this, man, this isn't the movie you change on the, on the day. You, you never, yeah. you yeah. never know. Yeah. Um, the only thing we, that came up out of nowhere just before filming was the Whirly Bird. That didn't exist anywhere. And then that came out of, I don't know, some twisted mind. So I, I, I want to specifically talk about the ending and mm -hmm. the you reveal Henry with that yeah. interesting haircut. Yeah. Um, did you do you know what that is like in terms of the sequel? In terms of, or is that sort of something you just throw in and you'll figure it out later? Hundred percent know what that is. That character, that is the true Argyle. Right. Is that um, uh, fuck? What did I write down? Uh, is that Aubrey Agra? Or, or is he the? version we see in the bar in the post credit scene, the older version. The younger version. Yeah, but the, you know what I mean? Well, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Aubrey Argyle, if you read the book, is what you see in the post credit sequence, which is the younger Argyle. Right. And That's so, Argyle before he became Argyle. That, well, before he became a spy. Right. And so is the, this gets confusing. Good luck. It, yeah. Is <laughs> yeah. that kid you see as young Argyle, mm -hmm. the younger version of Henry that we see at the end of the movie? One of them, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, it says Argyle, book one, the movie coming soon. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Argyle, book one, the movie coming soon. <laughs> it means what it says on the tin. We so, yeah, hopefully, if people like the movie, read book one, which is now published, and we're making that with Louis Partridge. Okay. Yeah. You can see how it gets confusing. Confusing, but rather obvious when you see it. Sure. Um, so, our, our and then Argyle 2 will be our characters that you hopefully liked in Argyle 1 and with Henry with a mullet. Right. <laughs> but it's so hard to talk about this until people see the movie. Yeah. Um, mm. Is, are Argyle and the Kingsmen in the same universe? Well, I'm hoping with Marv, we've got Kingsmen on the left, we have Argyle on the right, and I do think there's a space in the middle where I haven't played with yet, but both could um, help me get into the uh, middle ground. Because the bar in the post credit scene is called the Kingsman. Yeah. So for something like that, do you need anyone's permission to put the Kingsman there? Or because Marv owns it, you can do whatever you want. Well, I, I asked myself. Right, and exactly. I said, yes. yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. I mean, you see what I mean. I know. It's I unusual. Know. I know it's yeah, unusual. I, I mean, people are like, what? Yeah, I didn't realize that you owned um, the rights. And mm -hmm. obviously that means you can do whatever the hell you want. For good and for bad. Right, exactly. Um, so are there any Easter eggs in Argyle that fans should look out for? I don't know, actually. Sometimes I find Easter eggs which I didn't even know existed, but not many. There's um, not really. I think there's enough twists and turns that you know, God help the the audience if I say now nah, you got to find the Easter eggs. I think it'll head will you know, be a scanner's moment. Well, what I'm curious about. So um, you sh you finish the movie. Mm -hmm. This film has a tremendous amount of twists and turns, mm -hmm. and you're sort of keeping the audience guessing. And anyway, when you started showing the movie to friends and family, mm -hmm. what did you learn that actually impacted the finished film? The biggest thing I learned is that when you make a movie, I think it, it, you're a studio executive, and most people I say, "What well, you know." What notes do you have? The first note you are always going to hear is, can you make it shorter? It's like, can you make it shorter? And like, yep, and they're right. You know, and the audience, there's two things to learn from a when you when you test a movie, there are only two questions I am definitely interested in. Clarity, length, and well, length and pace. All right, so it's three, but it's two things that sort of com combined together. And um, 
this movie, the first cut, everyone said it was too long. I was like, okay, so we cut it right down. We took 15 minutes out, rescreened it, and everyone said, we have no idea what the hell is going on. So by making it shorter, the clarity just went out the window. So then we had to, and, and there was a balancing act because when you have twists and turns, you, know, you have an explosion, you gotta let that dust settle and then carry on and then have another explosion. But if you do too many explosions together, I realized they, people actually couldn't cope with it. They were like, whoa, what, what's going on? And no, and and also then the twists weren't quite as fun because they were, it, sure. was, it, it, it became too much of boom, 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 boom. So that was the first lesson I had. And the second one, this is a really interesting one because you know, like you, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. So it's amazing how you always learn. You know, I think, I think the moment you don't learn making a movie something, Maybe it's time to retire because you'd be on the illusion you think you know everything. Um, so, spoiler alert, in some way. So we have the big smoke dance, right? I don't know if you remember that part, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, vividly. And then we have a, let's call it an ice skating sequence. Oil? Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but, so, okay. So in the oil sequence, so the thing that was bizarre is I tried 700 songs on it. Right, and I pride myself on this, they call it the needle drop. I don't call it needle drops, I call it marriage of, of music, you know, source music and, and film. I don't like the word needle drop, I think it's, anyway, whatever. Um, couldn't get a song to, and every time I went, that's it, right? I, we've got it, and I, you know, we tried things from knock on wood to, um, uh, you know, Shania Twain, we tried all these different songs, when I watched, oh, we've we nailed it. We've screened it to an audience. Least like sequence, oil. Okay, fuck. And so everyone's saying you should cut the oil sequence. And I was like, do you know how hard it was to film? And I know that should not be a reason to not edit something. But I was like looking at the oil sequence going, I think this is pretty cool and original. How, I was like, why is the audience not liking the oil sequence? So it was really, I just couldn't understand it. And then I watched the movie again, I went, ah, could we have the big needle drop? Three and a half minutes later, we have a second needle drop in an action sequence. It's too much for them to, it was too much salt, too much sugar, whatever it is. So I said, okay, let's score it. Let's just put good old fashion score hero music. Wax it on, re showed the movie, everyone cheering and clapping the oil sequence. So it was a really big lesson for me. Um, so did you end up with a lot of deleted scenes or no? No, this way. Imagine the chaos of deleting because that's what happened. We deleted some scenes and everyone's like, oh, what the hell's going on? You know. Sure. So it was and I, I do say that about movies. If you can cut scenes and the movie still makes sense, you probably haven't got that good a movie. You know what I mean? You you know, so and other movies of mine where we had to cut scenes for for, for length, you have to go reshoot bridging scenes. Sure. Otherwise, you ain't got a good script. Um so one of the things that uh uh you wrote a fucking disco song mm -hmm. uh, for this movie. So it's like, uh, which it's very frustrating because it's clearly you have uh, uh, more talent than just writing and directing. But talk a little I bit of- co-wrote. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but but yeah. talk a little bit about, um, I believe it's called Electric Energy. Electric Energy. Yeah. So talk a little bit about uh, that song because it's catchy mm -hmm. and you have Boy George and Ariana and Nile. Yeah, yeah, ex I mean, exactly. Hello. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. talk a little bit about putting that song together. Um, it was an odd one because, again, we were, we were finding it hard to find a song that fitted the scene, the Bakunin action sequence. And so we started mucking around with score and, and doing disco vibes. And then I'm a big fan of Ariana's. And I said, hey, do you want to go singing? And then so she sang this idea we had. And I went, oh, that's not bad. Then we sent it to Boy George, who liked it. And then he he wrote some new stuff for it. And then, I'm, then Nile Rogers saw the film, an earlier cut, and went, hey, I could help that song. So I'm suddenly like, this is surreal. Um, and it's a, have you seen the video yet? Was, you did yeah, not show oh it to God. me yet. I'll, after this, I'll show it to you. Okay, so switching to the next thing. Yeah. You're a huge Beatles fan. I am. And um, so what is it actually like being, because I'm sure you don't geek out that much about certain things. No, I do. Oh, I, but talk about geeking out and being able to work a Beatles song in. That was sort of, again, a surreal, you know, what the fuck moment. So I, uh, you know, WTF moment, should we say. I, I um, you know, we were trying to find a love song for the movie, which I, which had both pathos and hope, right? And most love songs, I realized after now listening to virtually every love song ever written for this movie, they're either very sad or they're very syrupy and sweet, you know. And the, and 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 I was like, 
And I was with Giles Martin, who was helping us on other areas of the music. And I said, Giles, I can't find a song. And he goes, what about a new Beatles song? Yeah. I was like, yeah, Giles. And Giles and I would go back a long way and, and we like, you know, we just, we pull each other's legs, should we say, and we have a lot of fun with each other. I'm like, yeah, 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 new Beatles song. Yeah, there's, how many of them do you have at the moment? He goes, no, deadly serious. There's a new Beatles song. You can't tell anyone. I'll play it to you. And I was like, oh my God, I'm about to A, hear a new Beatles song, and B, when we made Snatch, every big British band wrote songs for Snatch, and I had to turn them all down, right? Because the songs just weren't good enough for the movie. And it's really embarrassing when an artist who you admire and respect plays your song, and especially when Guy would say it's brilliant and then leave the room and tell me, ah, I'll get rid of it. And I'm like, you fuck. And so then I'd have to go and explain, no, we're not going to use it. So I thought, oh my God, I'm now going to hear a Beatles song. I cannot, can I, I was thinking, could I turn the Beatles down? Um, I don't want to turn the Beatles down. And and the pressure of hearing a new Beatles song, was it was a weird thing. And I remember Giles played it. And I was like, dude, this was like it's been written for the movie, the lyrics, everything. I was, and so he slapped it on and it just, we didn't have to re-edit the song. We didn't have to change anything. And then Lorne heard it, my composer, and he went, I can do an orchestral version of this that will absolutely, blow, you know, just lift the audience. So then we, and then, so hearing it then become an orchestral piece as well. But also I got to, you know, meet Sir Paul McCartney, you know, you're like, what the hell? And all the other, you know, the surviving, well, you know, the Ringo's family and Harrison's and obviously Sean Lennon and Sean was an astonishingly bright and an interesting man. And I mean, this is what I mean. I mean, you're like, you can't make this up. A new song. And then, and I, I knew about this, this was over a year ago. And I couldn't tell anyone. And I was like, oh my God. And I, you know, I swore to them I wouldn't mention it. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, I've got a Beatles song and I can't play it to anyone. I'm not allowed to talk about it. And now I am allowed to talk about it. So it was an honor and it was a privilege and it was great fun. So one of the things I'm curious about is you put together this huge cast and mm -hmm. how much after you're casting some of these people, are you tweaking the script to the voice of the actors you are casting? And how much is it sort of their they're coming in to do exactly what's in the script. I think that's the, if you cast it right, it sort of happened, that's a, it's a very organic process that they, that, you know, I try to cast, you know, characters that I know or actors that I sort of feel are the character, you know, you know, I think Rockwell and Aidan Wilde, you, there's a lot of similarities, Henry Cavill and Argyle, a lot of similarities, Bryce, an kind of author. You, know, you just buy it, right? Um, I think probably the only actor that had to sort of create more of a character and be one would be Brian Cranston playing the villain. And I'm assuming he doesn't go around with shotguns and shoots people for making a mistake, I hope. Um, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I mean, I, but that's, I think the trick of casting is that you just believe that person is that person immediately. Um, what ended up being for you, because obviously no matter, you have a time and you have a mm. schedule and a budget. Yeah. What ended up being the, really the most challenging things that you needed that was in terms of making this movie with the schedule and budget that you had? There was several. Uh, first of all, this is the first time I've made a movie wearing a mask and with the whole crew wearing a mask and everyone in zones. It's just very difficult. And I had never realized how hard or not, it, well, how hard it is to communicate wearing a mask. I would have thought it was just about audible, but it's actually so much more of how we look at each other. We're reading every part of the, your, your face emotes more than I realized. I thought it was just the eyes and lips, but it's not, it's much more. Um, secondly, the fear of everyone getting ill or being the person to get everyone ill was, it, it was a weird, that was weird. And what was really hard about this movie, it was very hard to get a crew and we couldn't get, we couldn't get any sound stages. So every day I'd be turning up somewhere new to, a, you know, and it was we were shooting in like cow sheds sometimes, and I'm not exaggerating, or in fields and, and you know, the travel restrictions. So the logistics on this film was incredibly difficult, much harder than I ever imagined a movie to be. Um, but it was a crazy, I mean, it was, it was that, so that bit was hard, but what was great, but what was easy was having such amazing actors. So once, you know, we were like, the actors never saw the, the madness we were going through just to get a camera in the right place, even get lenses. It was so, you know, after the lockdown, you know, everyone was just, you know, we were we were very low in the pecking order. So in fact, we're so low, we couldn't even get stages. <laughs> so 
I, it's so funny you say this because I would never think of you and having difficulty getting stages, but I, I have heard from a lot of filmmakers at London and the London area is just, like, oh, it's, it's crazy. No, because like Disney took Pinewood, yep. Netflix, I think, took Shepparton and they all just went, Whoop, and they took it. So unless, you know, Warner Brothers has left and, and we were an independent. So that's what we had, nothing. Wait, yeah. uh, talk a little bit about Dua Lipa. Uh, yeah. Big part in the first act. Yeah. Uh, and she's really good in the movie. Mm -hmm. But yep. when did you know, like, oh, wait, she can pull this off? I just, again, I'm very instinctive about casting. And I needed someone that could be a femme fatale opposite Henry Cavill with a flat top. Right? right. You know, not easy. And to hold the screen 50-50. And I just, I just knew, you know, you, you, some people, they, they, like, even when we just did the video with Boy George and I put the camera on him, the, 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 I call it when the lens melts, where... It just melts. In the, I don't know whether it's the, the the human melting into the lens or the lens melting into them. But that, for me, I know. It's, I just look for a lens and see if the people either got that or they don't. And I don't know what it is. Dua has it in spades. I definitely want to touch on Brad Allen and mm -hmm. um, such. Uh, it's such a huge loss mm -hmm. for the film industry and also for you personally. Yeah. So can you talk about his contributions and why he was so fucking awesome at his craft? Brad was trained by Jackie Chan the master of all masters when it comes to action and to comedy and humor and bravery, right? And um, and when Brad and I did Kick-Ass, it, it, it was an extraordinary moment because I it, we, we just saw eye to eye. He was the only person I could say, I want to do a, I'm going to have a little girl and I want to go down the corridor and I want to do the, and he was like, great. Not everybody else was like, what? I say, Kingsman, I've got this idea. We're going to do a church sequence. It's going to go on and on and on. We're going to just, he's, Harry Hart is going to kill everyone. We're going to try and do it all in one shot. But before one shot became, I don't know, it comes this thing now. Let's do everything in a one shot. It's weird. You know, there needs to be a reason for doing one shot. It has to tell a story. I think it's become this big thing of one shot movie making or sequences. And he's like, yep. I said, and we're going to do exploding heads. And like, yep. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, Rasputin. We're gonna we're gonna make Rasputin. Every time I, he's the only person who would never try and talk me out of it. Everybody else would say you're crazy. This wouldn't work. So when I rang him up on on this, I said, look, I'm gonna do feminine action, and I got this idea. We're gonna do a dance of smoke, and we're gonna do an ice skating sequence because I felt the two things were more feminine than than masculine. And um, how about it? He's like, yeah, let's go. And then we sit there, and then I said, we can do a moke sequence. We'll turn the moke into a, to like a like a skateboard. And and he's like, yep. He I could not fade. He 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 just he got me, and I got him. And not having him around because he wasn't here to shoot it, and and it was hard for me because I was talking about you know, creative delegating or delegating creativity. I could with him. I could say la la la, and we'd sit there, we'd storyboard it, we'd stump visit, and I go off you go, and I knew it was going to come back exactly as we agreed. So this was difficult because I didn't have that. So I was like keeping an eye on the guys and listen, it's given the Vram lot because then they've taken over and they were all Brad's protege. So he's trained these young kids up. So they've they've you know, and we we're, we're all when we watched the movie, the first thing we all said to each other is. I hope we made him proud because he's a genius and he 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 is he has left a hole that I can never fill. So uh, I'm, this works completely as a PG-13 movie. Mm -hmm. You are pr you are known, except going back to Stardust, as like mm -hmm. an R-rated filmmaker. Yeah. Can you sort of talk about was there ever any talk about doing this as R-rated? And what did you find? Did you really enjoy working in the PG-13 space? Uh, this was always going to be a PG-13. Um. Um. It. <laughs> I think movies should be the rating that the movie needs to be for the film, right? So I don't think I could have done a PG-13 kick-ass or Kingsman. Um, I think if I remade Scarface, it's going to be an art, you know? Um, and I, 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 ironically, I, 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 I like R-rated, I don't, without realizing it as well. Um, but I, I, you know, this movie, I think it needed to be PG-13, and I was quite happy with that, actually. There were a few little edits I had to do, um, which I was like, oh, come on, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but, you know, yeah. they they have rules, and I was like, okay, I have to follow them. Um, but I, you know, the musical is definitely going to be R, because um, I just think if I'm going to do a musical, I've got to do something no one's seen before. Everyone will be like, oh, my God, because it really is. It has scenes in there where even I'm like, 
ooh, am I going to get away with this? Which gets me excited. And I didn't write it, by the way. Um, the writing, when he sent I was like, fuck me, there's someone out there crazier than me. This is exciting, um, which is rare. Um, but yeah, it's a PG-13 and I'm proud of it. Because I think, by the way, right now, I want families to go together and, and enjoy this movie. Well, I think also you talked about how you're... Um... I don't mean to bring personal shit in, but like, okay. you, you know, like you, your daughters really mm -hmm. were instrumental in a lot yeah. of things that helped make this movie. No, definitely. Well, they loved Romancing the Stone and they saw it. And, 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 and I, well, I, you know, we watched that during lockdown and, and I just, you know, I was feeling how bleak the world was then and feeling it is going to get bleaker. It sadly it has. And I said, let's make a warm, feel good hug. Ray sunshine in the dark world. That's what I think this is. Last thing for you. Mm -hmm. um, with the PG-13, the MPA lets you do one fuck. Yes. And you gave it to Bryce. Can you talk yes. Can you talk about how you chose where you wanted to drop your one F-bomb? I wanted to give it to the character where, where it would have most impact, be more surprising, and would land a certain moment. 